Welcome to another episode of the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast with your host, Andrew Langer. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. I'm your host, Andrew Langer. If you're watching us uh, today, uh, you know you can always listen to us on the various podcast platforms that are out there. If you're listening to us on one of those podcast platforms, come and check us out on YouTube. Leave us a like, leave us a a subscription, let everybody you know know about what's uh, going on. Very excited to bring our guests on today. Uh, Her name is Dr. Shay Bradley Farrell. She is president of the Counterpoint Institute for Policy, Research, and Education in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Shea is an expert in foreign policy and aid, national security, international development, and women's issues. Dr. Shea is also the first international senior fellow for the Center of Fundamental Rights in Budapest, Hungary, and is writing a book about Hungarian national sovereignty. We're actually going to talk about this. The book is out. It's a great, it's a great book. Uh, she has worked directly with the Trump administration, including Secretary Mike Pompeo and Senior Advisor Ivanka Trump on multiple issues while serving as the Vice President of International Affairs for Concerned Women of America. Recently, she was professor and subject matter expert for the Defense Security Cooperation University of the U.S. Department of Defense. Dr. Shea holds a Ph.D. and Master's from Tulane, where she was the adjunct lecturer in the International Development Studies Program in 2015 and 2014. She was visiting fellow, uh, visiting research fellow at the Center for Gulf Studies at the American University of Kuwait. She's a member of the Texas Public Policy Foundation's Border Security Coalition and former affiliated faculty and policy fellow at George Mason University's Shar School of Policy and Government. <laughs> and Dr. Shea, so the book, the book is titled, remind me again of the title of the book. Last warning to the West, Andrew, because uh, it really became a book for Americans. I went over there to do research on Hungary, and uh, I'm glad to explain that to you, but it, well, this it's is- clearly a warning. This is why I had you, I wanted to have you on now. Now, for those of you who I, I, I had uh, Dr. Shea on a couple of weeks ago when I was doing radio work and we talked for about 10 minutes, I said, 10 minutes is not nearly enough time uh, for talking to Dr. Shea about these things. As you all know, uh, Central Europe uh, is near and dear to my heart, what's happening there right now. And, and, and frankly, Dr. Shea, it's not just the conflict in Ukraine, which we're going to get to and talk a little bit about that, but it is this issue of Hungary and Hungary's transition from post-communism, uh, and then it, the, the, the deals, the things it was dealing with is, you know, it, it, it being in Europe and with the EU, and then now with the, the, uh, the election of Viktor Orban and the criticisms uh, of Viktor Orban. So this book is, in, is incredibly important because it tells a story that needs to be sold about issues of federal federalism and sovereignty and, and national identity. Uh, talk about the book. Well, you, you hit it there, Andrew. I actually went over to Hungary. I spent about three months there last year. I went over to, to do research about Hungarian national sovereignty because Hungary had, has made this huge splash on the world stage for digging their heels in against the Biden administration and against the European Union against the European Union and the Biden administration's uh, progressive, so-called progressive policies, the woke agenda, particularly on illegal immigration, transgender ideology being pushed into schools, and also in the war, as you mentioned. So, um, you know, Hungary overcame communism, the Soviet Union occupying them in 1991. And since then, they have tried to build a very, and they have, they succeeded in building a very constitutional, very, uh, uh, what's the word, prosperous, successful nation. Um, Prime Minister Viktor Orban was just reelected in the fourth, for the fourth time in a landslide victory the majority of the country there uh, are they're Christians, they're a Catholic nation. It's actually even written into their constitution. They've been a Christian Western uh, European country for 1,100 years. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, they finally got out from under communism. And what I learned when I went to Hungary is that they think the rhetoric coming out of the United States is communistic. They kept telling me it reminded them of their Soviet era, era, what's coming out of the U.S. So they had just, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, 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 go right ahead, please continue. Well, point is, you know, they they shrugged off communism and the Soviet Union in 91, and now the European Union is trying to impose a very top-down decision-making type of system on them and their sovereignty 
and they pushed back against it very successfully. And to hear the Hungarians talk about it, we need to understand that in America, we're, we're going to lose our freedoms if we keep embracing and entertaining the, the Marxism that is infiltrated into our country. You know, it's, it's interesting because one of the things that we talked about during the Obama years was the penchant for bureaucrats in America to want to adopt, as a, the, the phrase they use is adopt by inference, European regulatory standards, right? You know, the EU has this, again, as you say, coming out of, coming out of The Hague, they have this massive top-down command and control regulatory regime, uh, and, and you have folks in the United States who want to adopt that, and you have big corporate actors who may be doing business overseas, and they want some kind of symmetry uh, between the European uh, regulatory levels and, and, and here. And this is part of the reason, right, why Great Britain engaged in Brexit in, you know, 2014, 2015. They were, they were done with, you know, in no small measure with the European regulatory state. Other nations are contending with this issue of mass migration. And that's where I want to go with this, which is the, the, the open borders policy. Um, you know, we know here in America, and, and, you know, Milton Friedman talked about this, when you have no control over your border, you no longer have a country. This is essentially what, what Hungary was inheriting, what Orban was inheriting and fighting against. Talk about that. Well, in the in the early 2010s, uh, during the Arab uprising, they the Europe was seeing this mass influx of migration, mainly because Germany had said, "Hey, our borders are open," just like Biden said about the United States, and we're right. seeing the same thing. And Hungary is one of the countries where people are entering Europe to get to other countries. Right. So they tried to take these people in, register them, and send them through. You have to understand Hungary is a country of 10 million people. <laughs> yeah. um, by 2015, in, in uh, the early part of 2015, I think 40,000 people had come through Hungary in the first months. By September of that year, they were registering 400,000 people. Holy cow. So they declared a state of emergency and said to the EU, we cannot do this. We won't do it anymore. They started to erect fences. They've put policies in place to keep people below the border. Um, and I think that Biden could learn from this because it's, it's pretty darn simple. You know, I have been down to our border for weeks at a time, uh, interviewing ranchers down there, law enforcement about what's really going on. And it's, it's pretty simple. We put up barriers. We can put Remain in Mexico back in place. My organization, Counterpoint Institute, is one of the organizations that helped push HR2 through mm -hmm. the House recently, which I think is the most comprehensive legislation to date on border security. It's, it's fairly simple. But the point is, is the Biden administration is in direct uh, parallel with the EU globalists that want this mass illegal migration that tramples on our sovereignty. And last thing I'll say on that, Andrew, is, you know, at the same time, President Biden has been very careful to try to secure Ukrainian sovereignty, but he won't focus on U.S. Right. sovereignty. It really, it really is an incredible sort of the, the way we we've gone down that road. Let's talk a little bit more about the the book um, and and the issue of the woke agenda and pushing back against the woke agenda. Again, as I think I may have mentioned to you, I have this aphorism that I use, which is the the, the most well intentioned policies eventually bump up against very real realities, right? It, sure. You know, or as my father says. Uh, there are many roads to Utopia, however, almost traverse the surface of the earth. So on the immigration side of it, right? We listen, we want to be we want to be nice people, we want to be charitable people. You know, we're you know, in Hungary, we wanna, you know, these are folks who are fleeing war torn uh, the war torn Middle East. Uh we wanna be but on the other hand, at some point in time, when you're talking about four hundred thousand people in a nation of ten million, yes. that's the very real reality of the situation. Yes. This applies in other issue areas as well. Yes, it does. Talk about some of those. Well, let me talk about what you just said, because yeah. you hit the nail on the head there. You know, Hungary, during this war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, Hungary has allowed three and a half million refugees to come through their country. I've been in the Ukrainian refugee center in Hungary and seen what they yeah. were doing. They were giving people bus tickets and airplane tickets, taking care of their children, uh, veterinary care. So it, it's... 
not a matter of being humanitarian because the United States is the most humanitarian right. country in the world. Um, but there's a difference between saying, oh, my door is opened uh, and unlocked at night and I'm going to go to bed. So come in. I don't know who you are, right. but come on and sit in my living room. That's stupid. And also to address what you said about humanity, you know, Biden's narrative is that his immigration system is humane, orderly, and safe. Well, let me tell you what, Andrew, Counterpoint Institute, we were also one of the organizations that uncovered the fact um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, that record number of illegal immigrants were dying crossing our border because they have to collaborate with the cartels. They're, uh, you know, exhausted. They sometimes just leave them. Well, well, they do. Once they get, get them across the border, they don't care about them. So record numbers were dying, but Biden was telling the CBP to suppress those numbers. And I could tell you stories that would make you cry. Border Patrol telling me stories about finding women that had been raped and shot sure. by the cartels. Our Border Patrol, are, they are bearing the emotional stress and burden of this as well. It is not humane, orderly, or safe. Legal immigration can be, and ours is. But we have to, and that's, I guess, to, to circle back to the Hungary issue. We have a, a right as Americans, right? It, it is within our sovereignty. Again, one of the only, f f like, the function of government is essentially two things. It's to protect individual rights, right? To, you know, to, to make sure that, our, that we are our, our free people and to make sure that our borders are secure. And, and if you don't do any of those things, so Orban right. recognizes this and, and people in Hungary are recognizing this. Talk about the pressures, not the pressures from the EU, but talk about the, the more, I'm sorry, the less intrinsic pressures on Hungarian society that the, my, not just the migration, but the woke policies of the EU were trying to develop here. Um, and and, and yeah. maybe it's important to sort of talk a little bit about, about, you know, Hungarian history a little bit, right? I mean, being mm -hmm. one of the oldest, I mean, it was, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburgs. I mean, this is a, as you said, a, what, 1100 years, it's been a Christian nation. Yep. Talk talk about about the history. You don't have to get into too much detail, but I mean, talk a little okay. bit about that and the Hungarian identity. Well, and I, I summarize it in my book, uh, at least the fact that, you know, since they established themselves as this Christian nation, they have had Ottoman Turks and they have had the Habsburgs occupy them. They Throughout it, they have remained very uniquely Hungarian and a Christian nation. Right. In 1944, Nazi Germany occupied them and they were under Nazi dictatorship rule. In right. 1945, the Soviets came in, sieged Budapest, threw out the Nazis, and the communists took over, and the Soviet right. Union occupied until 91. So they know what it's like to be um, occupied and have their freedoms taken away from them. And they don't want that anymore. And they, they even expressed to me that Americans need to try to remember <laughs> that we we are free people and and they said to me you know americans don't remember what it's like not to be free but right. we do and to talk about the the woke agenda which is is the point they're free and they don't want this uh they call the woke agenda communistic they right. explained to me because it's directly out of the marxist playbook even legalized abortion trumpeted trumpeted as healthcare is diminishing parental rights. Like we see this happening with the transgender ideology, right? Dividing people along the lines of race, gender. This is Marxism just for a few examples. And the EU tried to pressure Hungary into putting gender um, identity curriculum into their schools. They took a referendum on it. They overwhelmingly, their citizens said no. So right. Orban told them the EU, we won't do this. Because of that, the EU and the Biden administration, our ambassador, David Pressman, has called Hungary in the press, on social media, even in Pressman's confirmation hearing, human rights abusers, right. dem democratic backsliders, authoritarian. So they get this continuously, and it's embarrassing for me as a U.S. citizen. Let's talk about, talk about that issue, because that, that, this is... 
very Orwellian. You know, it's funny, folks, before uh, Dr. Shea came on, you know, where I was just talking about a book I was reading, uh, a, a young adult book that I'd read when I was much younger uh, about, you know, Soviet, uh, uh, so Soviet abuses of power. Um, and you, you would, I, you, I, you'd mentioned 1984. And to me, yeah. we are living in an Orwellian environment in which there is double speak that is happening, right? You and I both can see that, that when you have an expansive central government and government interfering in, in ways with, you know, everyday lives of, of, yes. of people, we just dealt with an issue, um, uh, Dr. Shea, uh, the SEC was engaging in a rulemaking that was very fascist mm -hmm. in terms of the fascistic in terms of the merger of corporate and state power with regards to natural resources, mm -hmm. you know, so to call the Hungarian system of government authoritarian. Talk about why that's not true. <laughs> well, you can just go to Hungary and uh, read their constitution and walk yeah. around and see how their people are free. I mean, heck, Andrew, I, I saw gay couples there. Nobody yeah. cares that they're gay. Um, they're, what they were saying is that we want parents to be able to decide what our right. children see and whether they are um, preached to about transitioning or not. And I agree with you. There are so many, uh, so much of this Orwellian uh, speech talk kind of stuff going on. Uh, misinformation. That used to actually mean that something was not correct. Now right. it... Um, often is used to describe me or other people who voted for Trump or other people who believe in God, family, and country. And Andrew, in my book, Last Warning to the West, I'll put that in there. I've got 11, 11 points of communist psychological Great. warfare. Let's talk about that. Yeah. yeah. They were written in 1959 by our Department of Defense to teach security experts you know, about the psychological warfare of communism. If you look at those 11 points, every one of them applies to us today. And one of those is what you just pointed out, to take control of the narrative, use the narrative um, for your own propaganda, to twist it. You look at the word gender diversity. This actually meant, and this was during my PhD curriculum days, no. um, it actually meant looking at the disparity between men and women. Now, if I say to you gender uh, disparity, you think this whole transgender... The gender diversity, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yes, it's something totally different today. Sexual, reproductive, health care, and rights. Yeah. That sounds lovely, but what it's doing is selling access to abortion. I, I've spent a lot of time uh, years ago at the UN trying to get that term out of UN resolutions simply because it opened the way for um, us paying for abortion. There was a rulemaking in the fall done at Health and Human Services, which was done under the auspices, excuse me, of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. Now, not the Pregnant Women's Fairness Act, right. but the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act. So start there. And they wanted to extend the protections of the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act to women who were choosing to abort their, their, their pregnancies. Huh. Right? So, so, I mean, you talk about turning <laughs> these things on their head. This is, this wow. is exactly what we're what we're talking about here. So talk, but talk about these, these 11 points a little more, because okay. this is, this is really getting into the nitty gritty. And this is stuff that you and I have talked about in terms of the issues of, of uh, indoctrination and the long game, you know, stuff that was starting back in the late 1960s and into the 1970s coming home to roost today, turning Americans against one another, yeah. um, you know, changing, changing, you know, the, the, so that we no longer have any sort of common ground on which to talk about issues. Talk a little bit yep. more, expand more on that. Another one of them, Andrew, that maybe we talked about before is using a crisis to gain control. Absolutely. And if yes. we didn't have an example of that during COVID, I, I don't know what to, to try to, how to try to explain it to anybody sure. if, if, if they can't see that. Um, vaccine mandates, forced lockdowns, um, vaccine passports, even all over the world, we saw people being like, even in Australia, they were forced into these COVID camps, internment right. camps. So we could talk about that for an hour. Another yeah. one is to really um, beat your political opponents down and the people that don't believe the way you do until they lose the will to fight against you anymore. Yeah. Law, using lawfare is a way to do that. I believe, my opinion is, 
uh, President Trump's indictments are very similar to the Soviet show trials right. that put people up on trial and they weren't guilty of anything, but the public saw them as guilty because of the show trials. You know, it's funny, Dr. Shea, I, I had a recently had a conversation with uh, Ryan Young from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and they're doing a lot of work on the administrative state, as I am in my, in my job. Um, he, they, one of the things CEI is dealing with are these administrative courts. So we have our federal court system, but in these executive branch agencies, they have their own administrative courts, their own administrative law judges that are paid for by the agencies themselves. In the FTC, it took 25 years. For 25 years, they had never lost a case in their own administrative courts. And when they finally lost last year, the, 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 the commission, the FTC commission, overturned the decision of the administrative courts. If that's not Soviet-style justice, I don't know what no. is. We are now living in, an, in, in America. We have 1.5 million regulatory mandates on the books. Wow. You know, we are, and, and if, you know, Lavrenti Beria, the head of the Soviet secret police, said, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. Henry Silverglade says, you know, the average American commits three felonies a day. This is where we are now, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, and the thing is, you know, the European Union has uh, is uh, a, a great example of that, and I yes. think that it's influencing America quite quite often. The Biden administration seems to be locked up in in what they're doing. What they're doing, Andrew, is they have uh, introduced amendments into their treaties that have successively taken more and more freedoms away from the member states where right. they're not making uh, unanimous decisions anymore. So the power is being put in the hands of the EU. And I, you referred to, you know, Brexit. And yeah. actually, if you look all over Europe right now, I'm, a, I'm encouraged about it because in Germany, people are pushing back against um the farmers, do you know the story about right. that? Because the farmers are being 100%. taxed more while their subsidies are being taken away. They're pushing back against forms of socialism. Netherlands just uh, voted in a conservative uh, person who I believe is going to form a conservative government. Italy has a conservative prime minister. Javier Mille in Argentina. Right. For the first time, you know, socialist for over 800 years, this country. Um, I, and Counterpoint Institute, we've formed relationships with many different people. Austria, they have a Freedom Party. I've formed a relationship with them. They're leading in the polls because I believe people are tired of this top-down decision-making and the way that socialism destroys your society. Tell us a little bit more before I let you go. Tell us a little bit more about the Counterpoint Institute, the good work that you guys are doing. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. Uh, you can go to counterpointinstitute.org and sign up for a newsletter. It only comes out a couple times uh, a month. But what we really try to do is educate Americans about what's really going on in U.S. Sure. foreign policy and aid, because most Americans do not know what's going on, yet we are paying billions of dollars for it. Then we also influence uh, Capitol Hill policy legislation for conservative values. So, and last thing I like to say, Andrew, is, you know, we don't just sit around writing great policy papers, which we do that, yep. but we go down to the U.S. border. We go to Ukrainian Refugee Center to find out really what's happening to bring that back to America. Well, the, the book is Last Warning to the West. Last Warning what's to the West. And uh, hey, if you don't believe me, Believe Carrie Lake, who wrote The Ford. Yeah. Believe uh, Tucker Carlson, Lou Dobbs, General Michael Flynn, and Representative Paul Gosar, who wrote reviews for the back cover. And uh, they also, they support it because they're concerned about this country and the democratic decline that we're experiencing. How do folks find out more about the Counterpoint Institute? How do they find you on social media, Dr. Shea? At Dr. Shea underscore DC on X and Instagram. At Counterpoint uh, DC for at uh, on X and at Counterpoint Institute on Instagram and uh, CounterpointInstitute.org. Sign up for our newsletter. We'll let you know what's going on. You can get the book on Amazon. I, I need to get my copy. Well, I'll well send Dr. Shea, you on, Andrew. thank you. I appreciate that. Well, Dr. Shea, thank you so very much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you.
And this has been yet another episode of the Lunch Hour with Federal Newswire. Please come and check us out. If you're listening to us on fine podcast platforms, check out our YouTube channel. If you're watching us on YouTube, you know you can take us wherever you want to go and listen to us on wherever fine podcasts are, are, are found. I'm Andrew Langer, your host. Enjoy the rest of your lunch. This has been the Federal Newswire Lunch Hour Podcast, hosted by Andrew Langer. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream 